can't believe it's been a whole year already. Welcome Haskellings to the Advent of Code 2021. This is the preparation video and we'll get straight into it and create a repository on GitHub for our code for this year. We can skip adding these files because we'll copy those over from last year. I can then copy the clone address and I'll clone that into a 2021 directory. Now we can copy the files over from last year that we might need. These files are the cookie file, which I will check off camera as I suspect it might need updating from last year. The git ignore file, the advent of code library that we, that we created last year, the license file, the make file, the readme file, and the get and watcher scripts. Let's have a quick look at these so we can re-familiarize ourselves with them. The make file starts with a line to ask make to be a little less verbose. Then we specify the flags we want to use with GHC. We tell GHC to optimize the code, to be less verbose, and to use the language extensions no implicit prelude, tuple sections, and bang patterns, which are all quite useful. Next, we create some variables for the source files we've written so far. The wildcard function allows us to search on a given glob pattern. This is quite unique to the advent of code. In a normal project, we would be able to list the source files directly because they're fixed and not growing over time. The next few lines are specific to creating documentation for the advent of code library, and they're only there to deal with finding the main documentation to link back to. Next, we have the first rule, which make will run by default if you don't give a rule name on the command line. It will build and run all of the code we've created so far. Make rules specify dependencies between files and list the steps required to build one file from another. We are doing a string replace operation on our source file list to get the list of output files we want to generate. These are listed as dependencies of the all rule. Once the output files have been generated, this rule will then print them out. Because all is not an actual file, we list it later in the special phony rule so that make doesn't look for it as a file. The install depths rule is a rudimentary way to specify external dependencies. For a larger project, you should use a cabal file for this purpose. Similarly, the test and update test rules are a rudimentary way to do regression testing. Their main purpose is to check that we haven't affected previous results when we change something in the advent of code library. The next section is all about profiling and will generate a PDF of profiling information for all of the code so far. We didn't get a chance to get into profiling last year, but hopefully this year we can dive into that topic a bit. The clean and disclean rules remove files that this makefile has generated. The difference between them is that the clean rule won't remove the output files or documentation. Finally, we come to the main part of the makefile. These two rules generate the output files by running our code against the given input files. I label the two parts A and B, and I've yet to work out a way to combine these into a single rule. Please let me know in the comments if you have any ideas on how this could be done. The next rule simply generates the executables from the source files by running GHC. Lastly, we have the rule that generates the documentation using Haddock and also runs the unit tests masquerading as examples in the documentation. This is followed by two special make rules. Precious tells make that it shouldn't remove files matching that pattern unless really asked to directly, and Phony, as I mentioned before, tells make that these rules are not file names, so should not look for them. The next file is the readme file, which we just need to edit to update for this year. The get script is used to fetch our input files. These are specific to each user, so we need to grab the session cookie from our browser, and the cookie file simply puts this session cookie in the AOC underscore cookie environment variable, so that when we call curl, we can tell it to use that cookie. We first need to get the current date we use US Eastern Time because that is where Topaz lives. For each day in the advent calendar up until today, 
we check to see if we already have an input file for this day, otherwise we download it using curl. If you make your own script for this, it's really important to make sure not to fetch an input file more than once. The next file is the watcher script. We'll use this on the panel on the right here, and I'll be leaving that running there the whole time. What it does is use fswatch, available on many platforms, to wait for any source file changes in this directory, and rerun make as soon as it sees some change. The reason we run make in a subshell and capture the output like this is so that we can keep looking at the results of the previous run while it's working in the background. The funny escape sequences clear the screen and put the cursor back at the top before printing the output. Let's now have a look at the advent of code library that we built up last time. I'm first going to update the year here, of course. OK, so it re-exports a whole lot of useful core library modules, including the Prelude. This would be rather bad practice in the real world, but this will save us some time when doing these challenges. This way we don't need to worry too much about remembering where our core functions are coming from, as long as we know they exist somewhere. One of the Prelude functions we replace is the Interact function. Our version breaks the input up into lines, and for the output, runs show and adds a new line at the end. There's a few different variants we can use depending on the format of the input. Next up are the parsing functions. We first replace the parse function from parsec with one that doesn't need to specify a file name. This argument is only used for error messages coming from parsec. We also have a parse list function, which will parse a list of strings into a list of values but call error if there's any issues parsing any of the strings. If you're not familiar with the error function, it will print out the given error message and then terminate the program immediately, which is actually what we wanted to do in this case. We have some helper parsers as well, the first two of which read in characters and strings, ignoring case. Next, there's the enum parser, which is able to read in a string that matches a possible value of the output enumeration type. For example, the string red can be parsed into a primary color enumeration type. The last parsec-based parser here is a simple integer parser. Next, we have a type class for reading in binary numbers. We have an instance for reading in binary strings and an instance for reading in lists of Boolean values. We also have a new type wrapper for ints that replaces the default read and show instances with ones that work with binary numbers. We also have a new type that wraps strings for showing them without the surrounding quotation characters. The next function is very simple but also very useful. It counts the number of elements in a list matching the given value. After that is a function that is actually not so useful in a strongly typed language like Haskell. It attempts to mimic the tr unix command and works well with strings, but doesn't work well if you want to use it to map lists of values from one type to another. We have now a whole lot of vector functions. The first does a lookup in a vector but allowing the indexing to wrap around if necessary. This was useful for a particular problem last time, but probably won't find much further use. However, these functions that convert between lists and vectors will likely be used a lot at some point. Lists are useful for sequential processing, but vectors are more efficient for random access processing. The jewel in the crown from last year was the development of this summarize function. This boiled down version looks rather simple, but when you stare at it long enough, you realize that we are calculating the map M using a lookup into M itself. If you're familiar with lerb functions, this is a specific example of this, and as long as there are no cycles in the input graph, this can solve all manner of graph problems. We have some maths functions next one for calculating the discrete logarithm, and one for calculating exponentials under modulo arithmetic. We have a slightly faster replacement for the nub function, a map of map function, 
and a converge function, which will keep applying a given function until the value stops changing. As you might realize, this would be a very dangerous function to use in normal code because it has a high chance of not terminating. There's also a function for applying a function n times. Last year we had a few Conway-based puzzles in honour of Dr John Conway who passed away last year from COVID-19. So I'm going to skip over these grid processing functions, but we'll go over them again in case we need to use them this year. As you can see, there were quite a few variations made using different representations for the grid. Okay, so next up is a num instance for two tuples. This allows us to do normal arithmetic on simple tuples. There's also a function for doing scalar multiplication across a two tuple. We have some functions for converting between cardinal directions and two tuples and for rotating by 90 degrees or any multiple of 90 degrees. Lastly, we have a function for calculating the Manhattan distance between two points, which I'm sure we'll use at some point, and then num instances for three and four tuples. So that's it for this video. I'm going to go and commit these files to the repository, and I'll hopefully see you all tomorrow. Happy Haskelling!